Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to St. Paul's Anglican. My name is James, and it's so good that you can be here with us, whether you're joining us here in person in the North Hall or online via live stream. In the Christian Bible, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 107, it reads as follows, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. And a bit later in the same psalm, the psalmist writes, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and he fills the hungry with good things. Friends, whether you're a regular member or you're new or visiting, a special warm welcome to you. The God of the Bible, the one true living God, the God that we have just heard a bit about from this psalm is the God whom we worship. He is the reason why we gather, the one whose love is always good and whose goodness is always loving. And we see this most clearly in the Lord Jesus. And today what we're going to be doing in our gathering is we're going to be hearing the one true living God speak through his word, through the Bible, as we hear more about this Lord Jesus. We're also going to be praying together, knowing that God loves to hear our prayers. And we're going to be hearing a song as we think more deeply about the wonderful blessing and joy it is to know this King, this King Jesus. And friends, what I'd like to invite you to do now is to pray with me that God would bless our time together. Prayer is speaking to God and asking him uh, to grant our requests. And so would you please pray with me that God would bless our time together? Please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather here today. We thank you for your unfailing love, for how you satisfy the thirsty, and how you fill the hungry with good things. And Father, we pray that today you would fill us with good things. Fill us with the remembrance of your love. Fill us with the goodness of your word. Fill us with the joy of fellowship together, knowing that in your Son we are never alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Bible also teaches us that we all reject God. We all sin. The Bible teaches us that we are all sinners. But thankfully, in his loving kindness, in his unfailing love, God sent his son into the world to die for us, that we would be forgiven, that we would be purified from all of our sins. And the Bible reminds us that for anyone who confesses their sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and will purify us from all unrighteousness. What a wonderful truth. What a wonderful thing to be reminded of. And in fact, one of the things we do when we gather is we confess our sins. Christians throughout the whole world for hundreds of years have confessed their sins together. We have no reason to pretend that any of us in this room is not a sinner, but we confess it in trust, knowing that God is faithful and just and will forgive and purify us. And so would you please join with me as we pray this prayer of confession that's coming up on the screen. And if you sincerely believe the words, you can also say amen at the end. Let's pray together. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, as far as the east is from the west, so far away has God taken your sin. If you truly prayed that prayer and believed it, trusting in Jesus and his death and resurrection for you. No matter what kind of week you've had, no matter how you have sinned today, no matter how you will sin this week, trusting in Jesus means that you are forgiven and you are purified by the blood of his son, God's son, Jesus. So be encouraged by that, whether you've prayed it for the first time today or for the thousandth time. What a joy it is to be a Christian and to know 
that our sins are taken away from us. And we want to share this message in lots of different contexts here at St. Paul's. And one of the ways that we do that is through our children's ministries. And so I'm going to invite Richard Moe, who's one of our kids' leaders. Can you please make him feel welcome as he comes up? Thank you. And you can stand there, Richard, far away from me. Okay. Not as far as the east is from the west, but uh, as far as the lectern is from the Richard. So here we are right here. Richard, you're a uni student. You are a student at UNSW. What's this year been like just from the university perspective? From the university perspective, it's been very interesting, particularly with UNSW trimesters, a new system and COVID coming in and completely breaking the system that was already finding its, uh, finding its way to its feet. Um, yeah, it's been really strange transitioning to online classes, especially with campus ministry also transitioning online. Um, but yeah, I think overall this year has been all right. I've been surviving through God's grace and um, he'll keep sustaining me and UNSW through all of this. Mm. And you are one of our kids ministry leaders who serves particularly with our Chinese church congregation. What's that been like? I mean, what a year to be doing kids ministry online. What's that sort of looked like? Yeah, so when we started the year, we would have numbers of up to maybe 50 kids at, at a time. And we'd normally split um, those 50 into two groups of older and younger children. And then, you know, once COVID restrictions came in, we transitioned to online and then our team would start, our small team of maybe 10 people would start making videos each week. Um, and then maybe term two, then we looked at church-wide sharing the responsibility of making those videos, releasing one each week that the parents um, and kids will look at term two and three, same deal, releasing videos. This term has changed a bit. Now we're getting a much higher quality of production um, because the church has actually stepped in to um, produce those videos. And so we're making these long videos where we can just watch it go through a whole range of um, teaching, some games that they can do, some activities for them to do at home, and also looking into the lives of some of the kids um, during COVID. Mm. And I'll ask you about that in just a bit, but I just want to clarify, when, when Richard says the church has stepped in, what he really means is that faithful volunteers have stepped in from uh, night church and afternoon church. It's not just that there's, a, you know, a, some nebulous company that's come in. These are actually people here who are, are students and, and workers as well. Yes. Uh, like you, Richard. Agreed. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Richard, um, I know that in uh, January and February, you were looking at something like, you know, 50, as, up to 50, 60 kids coming along on a Sunday morning. What was the numbers like when, when kids were coming along online? Online, yeah, so that was a very different dynamic. Um, Sunday school didn't run in its normal method. What we did is um, all the Sunday schools decided to combine with our Friday night kids group called Ignite. And so we would have numbers of maybe 30 or 40 kids. And this is from the entirety of the St. Paul's Children's Ministry. So numbers were, I guess, lower. I think there were about 30, 40. I can't quite remember. So numbers were lower than before. But um, yeah, it's been really surprising to see how many kids have been coming back after we've done it in person. I did want to ask about that. So you've been in person for a number of weeks now. What's it been like? Have you been seeing a bunch of kids coming back out of the woodwork? Like, oh, it's great to see you again. Yeah, um, it's like that for the first five minutes. And then they, you know, run, break into our toy cupboard. And throw yeah, it right. OK, face. gotcha, gotcha. Um, but yeah, it's, it started off maybe 20 kids. So our first week back, we had 20 kids, which was really surprising. And that number has been growing. We're hitting about 30 to 35 now, which is really encouraging. And um, I think one of the most encouraging things is that there's a lot of new kids as well who are coming along, new families who are bringing along children um, who get to hear the gospel of Jesus and who get to really experience what it looks like to have something stable and to support you during this tough time. Mm. Now, obviously, not every family with, with their kids have been coming back. Um, some families may be feeling a bit uncomfortable with coming back. They might have some vulnerable members as well. Um, lots of people have good reasons for not coming back. And, and so f we've had this thing that's been produced um, called SPK. Do you want to explain what SPK is and uh, what's your involvement with it? Yeah, so SPK is generally usually stands for St. Paul's Kids, but every uh, now generally, and right. you'll, you'll have things like, um, I think today we had Slim Pants Kill, which um, it's, it's, it's fun little things that oh, go on, know. right? Yes. <laughs> Salt and Pepper Kicks, I don't know. <laughs> um, but it's, it's the kids' ministry kind of right. show, about maybe 30 to 40 minutes, um, where we get to dive into the Bible, look at a story, um, see the games that could be involved, with it, see physical challenges mm. that the kids can do at home, feel memory verses as well. Um, for me, I've been part of the team since maybe the second or third week. Mm. Um, that involves coming in here on a Wednesday afternoon and bringing the kids in, filming the kids, filming our own bits, 
Uh, for the most recent video, I was I had a bit of a different role. I was like an MC for the night, and yeah. I think well, you were wearing the same thing, actually, Richard. No, it was a, it, was, it was a different red shirt. Oh, a different you. red shirt. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, I think one of the most memorable things from that video was our uh, we, we were building towers, right? And so we were aiming to build the biggest tower, right? And um, I asked one of the kids, okay, this is your tower. It's called Sunflower Mountain or something. What was your inspiration? And he looks me straight in the eye and says, this was inspired by the slimness of Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Strangest comment I've ever had. You're no, slim and tall as well. But, I, yeah, I suppose. Right. And yeah, it, was, right. it was a slim and tall tower. But He's an observant child. <laughs> I, I appreciated him, I acknowledged him for his statement, and I moved on swiftly. Very the good. The <laughs> Richard, last question from me, which is, uh, how can we as uh, St. Paul's be praying for kids' ministry? I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty as well about what restrictions could even look like next year, how many leaders are continuing to serve. What would you say are some ways that we could be praying for kids' ministry um, at St. Paul's? I think one thing you can definitely be doing is praying for the leaders that are coming in, especially during this time when um, SPK might not even be continuing next year. Mm -hmm. So that will be involve another shift in how we do a leading. Um, so pray for the leaders who might be joining in, who might be considering continuing, and for maybe the different kind of skill sets they'll need to take. Like this year, we've already had to implement three different methods of teaching. Mm. Um, and I think also, especially pray for the kids and their families, because mm. some of them are still very worried about um, COVID. And pray that you know, even during this time, they they still find a safe haven. I say safe; they're quite rowdy. Um, <laughs> a safe haven where they can actually relax and hear a really, really good piece of news during this tough time. Mm. So yeah, pray for the leaders and pray for the kids and their families mm. to come to know God and trust in Him. Mm. I did say that was going to be the last question, but just really quickly, um, if, if someone was keen to think about kids' ministry, um, is, is there a place for them to be serving at kids' ministry at St. Paul's? I mean, yes. I wouldn't say no. Are, you, are we looking for specifics here? Sorry, it's a very leading question. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's right. Yes, there always is. There's always room for you to serve in any ministry, not only kids ministry. Thank you. That's it, Richard. That's it. <laughs> well, why don't I pray now in light of some of those things? Would you please join with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the joy it has been to see so many kids come back. But Father, we also recognize that this year has been very tough tough for many families who are a bit unsure about their safety and the safety of their families. A year when many leaders are unsure about what service in kids' ministry could even look like into next year. Father, we pray that you would bring rest and safety and calm and peace to the families of St. Paul's. We pray that kids would be able to find spaces to be able to hear your gospel, that they would be transformed and spurred on to be disciples of Jesus. And Father, we pray for the new leaders who are stepping into children's ministry and the leaders who have not yet stepped into the space of children's ministry, that they would be trained and equipped and supported and would serve faithfully for the kingdom of your son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Richard. Well, friends, we've now come to the most important part of our time together, which is when we get to hear God's word. And so if you've got your Bibles there, it'd be great if you could grab them. And in a moment, Vicky is going to come and lead us in a reading of God's word. But before she does so, I'm going to pray that God would prepare our hearts to hear him speak through his word. Would you please join with me as I pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that all scripture is inspired and breathed out by you. Give us ears to listen and hearts to receive what you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Last thing I'm going to say before Vicky reads is that we will have a number on screen for you to be able to submit any questions uh, in light of the sermon. And if you would uh, like to do so, please submit them and we'll have some Q&A time afterwards. Uh, hi, my name is Vicky and we'll be reading Matthew chapter 12, verse 22 to 50. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, 
that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will, be, will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruits. You brew of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to, go, have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you'll be acquitted, and by your words you'll be condemned. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given, given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge tree, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The man of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through a red place seeking rest and does not find it. Then he says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how you will be with this wicked generation. While Jesus was still t talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside, wanting to speak to him. Someone's, someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, He are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and, and mother. Good afternoon, everybody. Great to see you. My name is Jack. I'm one of the pastors here. It's been quite a while since I've been at Afternoon Church. Really wonderful to be back with you. When it comes to how people respond to the man Jesus Christ, it seems there's no shortage of options. You can believe that Jesus is the Lord of heaven and earth. You can believe that Jesus never existed at all. And there are countless options in between. For starters, there's the, there's the casual acquaintance response. I think of an old friend of mine who's not a Christian. He used to be very fond of wearing his Jesus is my homeboy t-shirt. You know, there's something very Australian about that kind of response. Old mate Jesus, love that guy. You know, such a nice man, always on about peace and love. What's not to like? I haven't really thought much more about it than that, but I'd like to think Jesus is on my side, you know. He's a top bloke. There's the, the vague disinterest response. I remember one time near Easter a few years ago, I was walking around Epping Station asking random people what they thought about Jesus and his resurrection. And I was amazed to hear person after person tell me 
yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure Jesus rose from the dead, but no, I, no, I'm not particularly interested in hearing what that might mean or why it most, might be the most amazing news ever. Vague disinterest. There's, there's all sorts of ways you could respond to Jesus. I'm sure you could add more. And our pluralistic world looks at all those options and says, all opinions are equally valid. Who really knows? Make up your own mind. You believe whatever you think's best. Go nuts. So it's shocking for our world as we come to look at the Bible and see the different responses to Jesus in Matthew chapter 12. It is shocking to see how exclusively Jesus himself sees all this. Because with Jesus, there's no range of opinion. There's no spectrum at all. There's, there's no shades of gray. It's just black and white. As he says in verse 30 of our passage, whoever is not with me is against me. The kingdom of God, which Jesus came to bring, is divisive. It draws a line. And there is no sitting on the fence in the end when it comes to Jesus. He demands a response from us. A passage like the one before us today invites us all to consider, are you with Jesus or against him? It'd be great to keep your Bible open there at Matthew chapter 12 so you can see God's word for yourself. And it's worth noting, I'm only really going to be covering up to verse 37 because there's, there's stacks even just in that chunk. If you have questions about the rest of the chapter, feel free to text them into the number. Any other questions you might have, send them in as well and we'll, we'll get to a few in Q&A later on. You can find an outline of where I'm going on the, the St. Paul's website as well if that helps you. Well, let's get into it. We've been talking about responses to Jesus, and we're going to start by seeing the responses to Jesus that are here in this part of Matthew. It's worth noting that this passage is part of a broader section, Matthew's chapters 11 and 12, and in that section we see all kinds of responses to Jesus. And they're primarily negative responses. In this section we see the rising opposition that Jesus' ministry provoked. In chapter 11, you see whole towns refusing to repent and turn back to God at Jesus' preaching. Even the great John the Baptist starts to doubt Jesus' credentials. And in the start of chapter 12, we saw last week, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, they now want to kill Jesus. The, the opposition, the temperature is rising. And in our passage today, it rises to new heights because people are asking a very pointed question about Jesus. Is he the son of David? or the son of the devil. The scene opens with Jesus performing one of his miracles. He casts out this demon. Have a look with me, uh, chapter 12, verse 22. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. The striking thing is how little airtime the miracle itself receives. We get this tiny little summary, and then Matthew moves straight on, because the thing that he's more interested to tell us about is the, the controversy that follows that miracle. And we go straight there. We see there's two sides. On one side of the controversy, verse 23, most of the people there are astonished by what's just happened. And they ask, could this be the son of David? The son of David, back in the Old Testament, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promised the great king of Israel, David, the one of his descendants would sit on God's throne forever. And based on the scriptures, the Jewish people were expecting that this Messiah, this anointed king who would come, would perform wondrous signs that he'd be authenticated by God with, with, with miracles. So the crowds, they see Jesus cast out this demon and they're thinking, is it happening? Is this the guy? Is he here? That's one side of the story. On the other side of the controversy stand our old friends, the Pharisees. And they're not buying it at all. They say, Jesus hasn't come from God. What are you talking about? It's the opposite. He has come from the devil. Verse 24, when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Here the Pharisees use this name, Beelzebul, which is a, a false god from the Old Testament. They give that name to Satan, the devil, the prince of demons, God's great spiritual enemy. So this is not at all a light accusation that the Pharisees are bringing against Jesus. They're saying, not only is this guy not the Messiah, the only reason he has this miraculous power is because he has been given them by the devil himself. I don't know if you've seen old movies where a character goes out to the dusty crossroads at midnight and meets the, the red, horny devil figure and signs the contract in blood, selling their soul to the devil to get some kind of magical power. The Pharisees are saying, that's the kind of thing Jesus has done. He's not on God's side at all. He is an agent of evil. Now, the fact that the, 
the Pharisees respond this way is really interesting, particularly if you happen to be a little bit on the, the skeptical side. Maybe, if you're honest, you find it hard to believe what the Bible says about Jesus' miracles at all. But if Jesus was just a big phony, he was just a con man, then you'd think the easiest way for the Pharisees to bring Jesus down would be to say, obviously he didn't really drive out a demon, it's just a trick, he's a charlatan, and then find a way to expose his supposed miracles as frauds, or at least try. But the Pharisees here, Jesus' most bitter enemies, they didn't even attempt to discredit the miracle itself, assumably because they couldn't. The fact that Jesus performed miraculous healings was incontrovertible. It was plain for all to see. And so the Pharisees don't dispute that Jesus is powerful. They can't. What they can dispute is the source of that power. The argument they're making, it's like if Jesus was a car, they can't deny that the engine is running. So instead they're saying, well, what kind of fuel does this car run on? Divine diesel or unholy unleaded? I'm not making any comment about petrol, you know, it's just alliteration. <laughs> son of David or son of the devil, that's the conflict that's set up between these two responses to Jesus. But what does Jesus have to say in response? We're going to move on now and see how Jesus responds to those responses. This is the response by Jesus. And Jesus has a lot to say. His response comes in three parts. In the first part, we see Jesus respond directly to the Pharisee's accusation. He says he's not the son of the devil. Rather, what he's doing in his miracles is he is showing them that God's kingdom has come. To start with, Jesus shows that the Pharisee's accusation just doesn't make sense, even on the simple level of logic. Read from verse 25. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, "'Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined.'" And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. What's the problem with saying that Jesus drives out demons by the prince of demons? Well, for starters, Satan is smart enough to know the old saying, united we stand, divided we fall. Any group that succumbs to internal squabbling is not going to be strong enough to face up to its opponents. And think of the opponent that Satan is trying to face up to, God himself. Why would Satan use Jesus to drive out his own demons? He can't afford that. It just wouldn't be a great strategic play for the devil. And furthermore, verse 27, some of the Pharisees themselves were driving out demons. Does that mean that they are powered by Satan as well? The Pharisees can't accuse Jesus without throwing their own people under the bus. So their accusation, it's ultimately self-defeating. It, it fails just on the level of its own internal coherence. But after proving the Pharisees wrong, Jesus doesn't stop there. He wants them to understand the right explanation of what's been going on. Because Jesus is no mere man. There is a spiritual power at work in him, but it's not an evil spirit. It is God's own Holy Spirit. Look at verse 28. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus says, you want to know what fuel my engine's running on? I am empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's the picture that Matthew has been painting all along in his gospel. Gospel. Back in Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus was baptized, the Spirit of God descends from heaven like a dove and rests on Jesus. Well, we saw just last week, Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. Have a look, just a a few verses up. Jesus' ministry fulfills Isaiah's prophecy that God would one day send this servant with the Holy Spirit on him. Matthew 12, 18. Here is my servant whom I've chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. Matthew wants us to know this is who Jesus is. He is the Lord's servant anointed with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been poured out upon him. And so the Holy Spirit and Jesus go together hand in glove. That's how Jesus is casting out these demons, not by Satan, by the power of the Spirit, by the power of God himself. What are we to make of that? What do we do with that? Well, Look at the fact that Jesus says that this fact has massive implications. The implication is that God's kingdom has come. Verse 28, the kingdom of God has come upon you. 
That phrase, kingdom of God, is massive for the whole New Testament. It's about the establishment of God's rule as the rightful king of the world. And Jesus says, the kingdom has come upon you. It's here already. He's saying that as he roams the countryside in Galilee, teaching people, healing people, God's kingdom is not some far off, maybe one day, pie in the sky kind of thing. The kingdom is arriving now. It's breaking in. As Jesus casts out Satan's minions, the first shafts of the kingdom's light are breaking in through the clouds of darkness. And to help us get this more, Jesus illustrates it with this little picture of robbing the strong man. Have a look at verse 29. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. It's, fun. it's kind of strange to picture Jesus as a robber, but that's the image that he gives us. And it's a straightforward point. If you're going to rob a strong man, you'd sure better tie him up first, right? Here at St. Paul's, our strong man in Everett, as I'm in, 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 what am I saying? Our strong man in residence, as I'm sure you know, is Mike Everett. If you want to break into Mike Everett's house, I'm not suggesting you should, but if you wanted to, you'd better find out some way to incapacitate him, because otherwise it's not going to end well for you. In the same way, Jesus is like the robber who has come into this world to tie up Satan, the strong man. Jesus is going about driving out Satan's demons, beating Satan back, binding him, handcuffing him, incapacitating him. Why? So that Jesus can rob him. So he can steal away all those people trapped under Satan's tyranny and bring them into a kingdom of his own. Friends, this is the wonderful good news that this passage has for us. Because you and I are by nature sinners, trapped under Satan's tyrannous rule. Powerless. But Jesus has come to break Satan's power and overthrow his kingdom. He's come to rescue us out of this dominion of darkness and bring us into the kingdom of his own. That's the good news of this passage. And I fear that it's often lost on people like us today modern, enlightened Westerners, because we find it pretty hard to take the very idea of Satan seriously. Maybe you feel a little bit embarrassed by the demons and devil passages in the Bible like this one. As a a modern person, it it all feels a little bit ridiculous and hard to believe. I have felt my share, my fair share of that in the past. But we need to shake off that worldly skepticism and follow Jesus' example here, because Jesus certainly did not scoff at the devil. He took him seriously. It's not foolish to believe in demons. It's foolish to underestimate their power. I mean, look at how Jesus himself describes Satan. He has a kingdom. He's called the strong man. It's assumed that Satan is no idle threat. He possesses actual power. Or as the apostle Peter puts it, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. When it comes down to it, I'm sure that you do believe in the devil because all of us at times will feel the sting of his power in the attacks that come. Perhaps for you, it's that little whisper in your head that says, oh, this time you have blown it. You've sinned way too badly. There's, there's no hope now. There's no way God will forgive you after that. In those moments, the answer is not for us to scoff at Satan like our world wants to and laugh him off, laugh him off as if he doesn't exist. Now, the answer for us is to remember with joy that there is a greater power than Satan. To look to Jesus, who came to bind the strong man and snatch you and I out of his grasp. We ought to hold dear words like these ones from the hymn that we're going to hear a little later on, Before the Throne of God. It says, When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, what do I do? Upward I look and see him there, Jesus. See him there who made an end of all my sin. See, as much as we don't want to underestimate the devil, we don't need to fear the devil, nor succumb to the power of his attacks, because we have a greater king who has come to establish his kingdom and make us his own. That's the first part of Jesus' response here. He's certainly not driving out demons by the prince of demons. Jesus is God's spirit-empowered king who has come to bind Satan and bring in the kingdom of God. But Jesus moves on. 
And the next question is, what does the Pharisees' accusation tell us about the Pharisees? And that's where Jesus goes next. He tells us that there is a way to respond to the kingdom he has brought that's not just wrong, it's unforgivable. And he calls that kind of response blasphemy against the Spirit. Jesus wants the Pharisees to be clear that there's, there's no middle ground when it comes to him. Verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. There is a general principle here, and we'll, we'll come back to that, but in context, this is first about the Pharisees. They have refused to align themselves with Jesus. They won't recognize him as God's spirit-anointed king, and that's not a neutral thing. It's not like they're standing there at the buffet of options and say, oh, no, I won't have any Jesus Messiah, thanks, not today. It's, it, it's not a neutral thing. In refusing to align with Jesus, they have made the choice to stand against him. And Jesus goes on to outline just how serious that kind of decision is. Verse 31, And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. I wonder how you feel hearing those words. This is a tricky verse and raises a lot of questions. Jesus talks about here about something that will not be forgiven. And that should sound quite surprising to us. Doesn't the Bible tell us that God is full of mercy and because of Jesus' blood, we can be cleansed from all sins if we repent and turn back to Jesus and ask his mercy? And that's where verse 31 starts. Every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. But, and there's an exception. And as much as it may shock us and unsettle us, Jesus says in no uncertain terms, here is something that will never be forgiven. So this is something we need to take seriously. We need to understand what Jesus is saying. What is blasphemy against the Spirit? Hearing the word blasphemy, I think the thing most people think of first is the way that some might use Jesus' name as a swear word, you know, maybe when they stub their toe or something. And as terrible a thing as that is, it would seem strange if that was the one unforgivable sin and not murder or genocide or something. There's more going on here than that. The word blasphemy means slandering or cursing. It means speaking against someone. That's the way that it gets elaborated on in verse 32. But what kind of speaking against is Jesus talking about? If we're going to make sense of this phrase, we need to see it's not just some independent saying. It, it comes to us in a context. It's here in the response to the Pharisees. And remember in verse 24, the Pharisees said that Jesus drives out demons by the devil in verse 28, Jesus said, no, he drives out demons by the Holy Spirit. So you put those two things together, what the Pharisees have done is call the Spirit of God Satan. They have bad-mouthed God himself and slandered him and mislabeled him to the extent that they have called the Holy Spirit the devil. And I hope you can see that that is not a light thing. What's more, we, we get the sense that this isn't just some ignorant, naive mistake by the Pharisees. This is a deliberate and willful rejection of God. That seems to be the point in verse 32. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. The Son of Man is the title that Jesus typically uses for himself in the Gospels. It's the way that he has presented himself to the world in his ministry. And Jesus seems to be saying that if the Pharisees had spoken against that, if they just met Jesus the man and mistakenly thought him to be demonic, I mean, that would still be a serious charge to bring against him, but it would be forgivable. But that's not what the Pharisees have done here. The Pharisees haven't rejected Jesus innocently. They've rejected him after seeing him demonstrate his divine authority time and time again with countless miracles, with his authoritative teaching, and in the face of that clear and repeated and unambiguous evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, the Pharisees want to kill him. They reject him. They don't just reject him. More than that, they call him evil. How stubborn must they be? How hardened to God must their hearts be that when God's king stands right there in front of him, they scowl at him and call him Satan? That is blasphemy against the Spirit. 
utterly rejecting the spirit-empowered king, knowing full well who he is, calling him evil instead of good. Jesus says this is something that will never be forgiven. Not now, not ever. He's saying that people like this are so hardened, so far gone, that there is no longer any possibility that they could realize that they have it wrong. There's no possibility that they would turn back to Jesus and find forgiveness. Anyone who comes to Jesus will be forgiven. But these people are so hardened that that's something they're never going to do. They're past the point of no return. Now, what are we to make of all that? How would we know to today, say, when someone has blasphemed the Holy Spirit? Does there come a point where, where someone's so hardened to Jesus that we can know that they've committed the unforgivable sin, so we should stop praying for them, stop sharing the gospel with them, because there's no point. If you can't be forgiven, that's the end of the story, isn't it? I take it that's not Jesus' point here. Not least of all, because verse 25, before Jesus says anything, it says, Jesus knew their thoughts. Jesus knew exactly what was going on in the Pharisees' hearts because he's the Son of God. By contrast, we never know, really, what's going on in someone else's heart. So as far as we know from our human point of view, it is always possible that someone's rejection of Jesus might be less serious, only temporary. And so we will keep praying and keep pleading with everyone until their dying breath to come back to Jesus. Well, if this passage is not telling us how to look at others like that, then what are we to make of this passage? I take it this is a warning for each one of us, a warning for us to heed. The warning is whatever you do, don't follow the Pharisees into this unforgivable sin. Whatever you do, don't become so hardened to Jesus that you would turn your back on him, even though you know full well who he is. You might find it hard to believe that would even be possible. You know, you look at what the Pharisees do and think, oh, I'd never do anything that serious, would I? I think in practice, this is a gradual process. How would it happen? You know, what would the warning signs be? Maybe it's your fleeting desire for some pleasure of sin. The thing that God says is wrong, but you really want to do it. And you start to wonder, well, if God would deprive me of that, is he really so good? Maybe he's a demon after all. Maybe it's you still go through the motions, you, you listen to the Bible, you read the Bible, but you don't really read it. You've read it before. You know what it says. You've mastered the word. And so you stop letting it master you. If you fear that you are starting to walk down a path that ends in rejecting Jesus, it can be tempting to fixate on that, to, to keep looking in with your heart and and. You know, a verse like this can lead us to anxiety, wondering, have I blasphemed the the Spirit? You know, that thing I did last week, am I too far gone? Am I beyond the pale now? I want to suggest to you that looking inward in those moments is only ever going to make us more self-absorbed, more crushed by guilt, and ultimately only lead us further down the path to destruction. And instead, what we need in those moments is not to look inward, but to look upward, and to forget ourselves and fix our eyes on Jesus, and remember what He has done to cleanse us from sin. If you are ever even slightly tempted to think that Jesus is not good, then remind yourself just how good and loving and forgiving he is. That he came in to bring in his perfect kingdom and bind Satan and do away with evil, even at the cost of his own life, for your sake and mine. Whatever you do, don't turn your back on Jesus but keep turning back to Jesus. Well, that's the second part of Jesus' response to the Pharisees, the way to respond to him that's unforgivable, blasphemy against the Spirit. And as Jesus finishes, he broadens his point out, because just as the Pharisees' blasphemous words have revealed what they really think about him, so too for everyone, our words reveal the response of our hearts. Jesus makes this picture by using a common image, the tree and its fruit. Verse 33, make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognized by its fruit. The fruit a tree produces reflects the condition of the tree it came from. That's simple enough, right? When it comes to apples, I don't know about you, but I'm a big pink lady fan. 
And if you want sweet, crunchy pink ladies, don't go looking on the tree that's rotten to the core. That just makes sense, right? That's, that's obvious agricultural advice. But in the same way, Jesus says, you don't get good words coming out of evil hearts. Verse 34, you brood of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. We have this saying, the eyes are the window to the soul. Well, for Jesus, it's the mouth, which is the window to the soul. Our words speak volumes about what's really going on inside us. And you can see that in the Pharisees, like we've seen. Their slanderous words against the Holy Spirit reveal the depths of their rejection of the Messiah. And so those words they've spoken will be the thing that condemns them on the day of judgment. But Jesus finishes out this section with an invitation for all of us to consider what our words say about our hearts, because we must give an account for what we say. Verse 36. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Everyone will give an account, me and you included. On the last day, we will all stand before the risen Lord Jesus as our judge and be held accountable for every empty word that we have spoken. That word translated empty there means worthless, unproductive, useless. Jesus doesn't just highlight the words which are bad, per se, you know, insults and hurtful things, we might say, unkind words that offend people. It's not just those things. It's, it's even our idle chatter, the mundane things we say, our, our endless prattle which just fills the air, doesn't accomplish anything. You know, nice weather today. How about that local sports team? I find Jesus' words here sobering because I certainly find it easy to think of words as just these cheap, insignificant things that we just throw around willy-nilly. Sometimes we talk even without thinking. In contrast, Jesus says words matter because they reveal what's in our hearts. And so we ought to consider our words closely and pay attention to what is coming out of our lips because that'll tell us something about where our hearts are at. What do you think your words reveal about your heart? Think of the kinds of things you talk about, the conversations you have with people. On the day of judgment, will your words reveal a heart that cared for other people? As you asked how people are going and asked how to pray for them and sought to help them? Or will your words reveal a heart that was more concerned about self-promotion? Will your words reveal a heart that, at the end of the day, just wasn't that interested in people. You just wanted to fill the awkward silences and stick to the superficial and avoid ever getting to anything deep. Will your words reveal a heart that wanted comfort and worldly goods and recognition? Or will your, hearts, will your words reveal a heart that loved Jesus Christ and wanted the world to see his glory more than anything? In short, will your words reveal a heart that was with Jesus or against him. This passage has shown us different responses to Jesus. We've seen how Jesus responded to them, and it's time for us to consider, what's your response to Jesus? The picture that Jesus paints in this passage for us is of a world at war, spiritual war. Jesus came to bring this great clash between the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. And if there's one thing that we cannot do in light of that, it is stand on the sidelines. Jesus says, if you are not with him, you're against him. We can't sit on the fence. I want to talk to you today if you would consider yourself a fence sitter. Maybe you're here, you're asking questions about Jesus, you, you haven't worked out what he's on about. You, the jury is still out for you. If that's you, hear Jesus' words here that there is no sitting on the fence. If you don't run to Jesus and embrace him, then Jesus himself says that you are against him. In the great conflict that rages in our world, you are on the side of the Pharisees and the demons and Satan himself. And that is no worse place to be than that. Come to Jesus while there is still time. And for those of you who are with Jesus, 
We still need to hear the, heed the warnings that Jesus has given us today. Whatever you do, don't let yourself be hardened to Jesus the way the Pharisees were. Pay attention to your words and what they reveal about your heart. And above all, keep looking to our Lord Jesus. Thanks be to God that he has come to bring the kingdom. He has come to bind the strong man. That he has stolen us away from the tyranny of Satan to make us his, to bring us into his kingdom forever. All praise be to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus to break the power of Satan, to establish your kingdom to snatch us back from his grasp that we might be yours. And we pray that you would help us never to have our hearts hardened to Jesus, but help us to keep coming back to him always. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our enemy is real, and yet we have a king, and we have a God, who um, are great and powerful and mighty, and yet still love us and allow us to approach him as easily as a child approaches a brother or a father. So please stand and make melody in your hearts as we sing before the throne of God above. Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. Please have a seat.
chapter 12. We've got a number of questions, mm -hmm. but I think we only have time for two. Yeah. So the first one is this. In the Pharisees' rejection of Jesus as the Son of God, is it an immediate unforgivable sin, or does it only become unforgivable once someone dies? Yeah, really a thoughtful question. I love the question. Thank you. In some ways, the whole question of when is sin forgiven is in the background there, and that's a big one. For a person who is not a Christian and then comes to Christ and repents, when, when are they forgiven? You know, in one sense, the penalty for sin was paid 2,000 years ago when Christ died on the cross. Our experience of forgiveness is that the moment we repent and put our trust in Jesus and receive the Spirit, we are cleansed from sin, from its penalty, and it's from its power for past, present, future. It's not like every time a Christian sins, you're in this like, state of damnation now, you need to repent, and then you can be forgiven again. No, like, forgiveness is this, this state that we have because of the, the precious blood of Jesus. So for the Pharisees, were they not forgiven the moment where they make this, you know, this, this, this passage here, or is it something later on? In a sense... Forgiveness is the, you know, unforgiveness is the default state, right? They have rebelled against God and they're in this state of rejection of Jesus and they're, they haven't been forgiven. And the point is that they will not be forgiven. Not now, not ever. I take it that from God's point of view, the moment that they had this interaction with Jesus, there was this, this line in the sand and, and humanly speaking, there's no possibility that they would come back to God after that. So there, that, that does seem to be this, this crystallization of their rejection at this point, that this is the, the point of no return. And they're not forgiven then and they won't be forgiven when they die. That seems to be the, the picture that Jesus paints for us, I think. Does that help? Yeah, I think, so. I think so. I think what you're saying there about the fact that it's not as if God's on a swivel chair and every single time we sin, God's like, oh, not happy with you now, turns away. So I ask for forgiveness. Oh, okay, now I like you again. There's more of an eternal perspective of our sin and whether we're forgiven. Yeah, that's right. Swivel chair theology, take it to the bank. Um, second question is, how much power should we attribute to Satan? Uh, how much does he influence our thinking and our actions? Yeah, another great question. So I take it the, the things that we want to say, some of the things I've said this afternoon, we shouldn't underestimate Satan. We shouldn't think that he's not there and has no power. You look at something like the, the first couple of chapters of the book of Job, and you see how God has entrusted all this power to Satan. Jo Satan has given power over Job's life and his, his, even his, his, his health, his, his children's lives, his, his livestock, everything. There's, there's so much that Satan has under his authority. I mean, in Ephesians chapter 2, it calls him the God of this world, lowercase g. Satan's power is real. He is the, the one who's the, the ruler of this age. In some ways, Jesus' kingdom is broken in and, and will come in its fullness and over him forever. But yeah, he is powerful. In the day-to-day, -day, what do we make of that? Yeah, I take it that as Peter says, the devil is prowling around looking for someone to devour, and we will feel his attacks. And he has the power to make us doubt our you know, salvation in Christ. He has the power to make us think that we are worthless and are completely incapable of receiving God's love. He has all those sorts of powers to influence what we think, and you know, he's the one who brings temptations against us. So don't underestimate his power, and yet don't be afraid of him, because Christ has conquered him. James tells us to resist the devil and he will flee from you. Someone who is trusting in Christ is the, the thing that the devil is afraid of more than anything. Probably more than anything except Jesus, yeah. Mm. And, and in that James passage, it's not just resist the devil, it's submit to God and he will flee from you. That's right. As well. Yeah. So I think that's really helpful there. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jack. Really Thanks, appreciate James. it. Uh, there are a bunch of questions that we didn't get to answer, but you can uh, hopefully this week we'll be able to get an episode of the uh, extras up and you can hear some of those questions answered there. We're going to have a bit of time of family news now, and we've got a few things to talk about. First of all is that uh, if you uh, would like to share any prayer requests or let us know that you're here via li um, on the live stream, please do fill out a Connect card. It really helps our membership team in terms of seeking to care for our members and know who's been interacting with God's Word and really is a helpful way for us to know that you're here. But also, I think it's really encouraging to be able to share your prayer requests with the church family as well. Speaking of the church community, on the 19th of December, 
I think I got that date right. Yeah, 19th of December, we've got Super Saturday. Now, unfortunately, I have no tag team this week, unlike last week's Family News Time, to be able to go, what are you doing on the 19th of December? I don't know, Tim, Bernie. But what we're doing is on the 19th of December, we're going to have a wonderful opportunity to be able to gather as a church family and actually participate in a number of events. Now, I... Uh, what I think we have now is we have five confirmed events so far, but we would love some more people to volunteer to host an event or two. And we're thinking particularly about some outdoor uh, events. If you'd be someone who'd be keen to host an event for us, that could be something like a picnic or a barbecue. It could be a, um, you could do an outdoor arts and crafts thing. Can you make dumplings outside? I'm sure you can. Basketball, frisbee, all that stuff. It'd be a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to spend time together. On top of that, one of the other things that we're hoping for these socials on Super Saturday is that we'll have an opportunity to invite some of our friends who don't know Jesus to come along and just have a chill, cash, fun time together uh, as, and, and as they can spend time with us as a church family. So that's something to think about. 19th of December, it'd be really great if you could host an event as well. Toys and Tucker is also something that we're still doing. I believe this is the last week that uh, we'll have an opportunity to drop off any uh, food uh, or toys um, in the church office. The church office is open from 9 to 4 on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, and if you would like to bring something in, please do so. I'm going to invite Pip up now, and then after that, I'm going to invite one of our wardens, Justin, up to share something else. But here's Pip. Hello, fellow Bible boy. Hello. What's up, Bible boy? Um, Christmas is four Sundays away. Does that blow your mind? Maybe not. It's not that surprising anymore. It's coming. Everyone knows Christmas is coming. Um, we want to uh, celebrate Christmas, and we want to invite the community around us uh, to come and celebrate Christmas with us. Um, one of the things that we're doing after church is we're going to set up a camera in the cry room. We want to create a bit of a promotional video um, letting the community know what we uh, think about Christmas and why Christmas is important to us as a church. And we're going to put this video on Facebook and promote it and hopefully reach thousands of people living in Carlingford. Um, so on your way out of church later on, um, can I encourage you, if even if it's just yourself or in a pair or in a triplet, why not just stop by the cry room? The question is going to be, um, what does Christmas mean to you? And you can just rant for 20 seconds and tell us what Christmas means to you. And we're going to put it into like a fast cut compilation video and put it on Facebook. Um, so let me encourage you to be bold and to do that. Um, we'll edit it so to make you all look good. You know, you know, if you say something that's not quite right, that's okay. All good. So I hope to see you in the choir room later on. Cheers. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Lowe. I'm one of the wardens here at St. Paul's. I go to the evening service. So I know I haven't met many of you, but I would love to uh, get to know you over time. Um, so I'm just following up on an email that was sent out on Friday by the wardens. Um, really confirming the wonderful news that uh, the Reverend Dr. Raj Gupta has uh, accepted uh, the Archbishop's invitation to become the senior minister here at St. Paul's, Carlingford and North Rocks. So that's wonderful news. Uh, Raj is currently the senior minister at um, Toongabi Anglican and he's been there since 2007. Um, prior to that, he was assistant minister at Engadine Anglican and also at Christchurch St. Ives. So he's married to Nicole and they have three children. Um, Jordan's 19, I think he's at Medical Science uh, University and Lauren's uh, doing her HSC next year. So it's a big change for her as well, of course. Uh, and then they've got Ryan who's 15, I think he's year 10. So he loves cricket, apparently that's <laughs> where we met him. Um, now they're, right, Raj is gonna, and his family are gonna be starting next year. So it's 23rd of March. Uh, 2021, so it's a little bit of a transition time. Uh, so we certainly want to come together and really, you know, pray, encourage him and his family, you know, over this transition period that as he comes to, you know, be, to, to promote the gospel here at St. Paul's with us. Um, we also wanted to thank the nominees. 
who worked very, very hard over this last six months or so. It's a really big job. So that was Alan Moran, that was Kath Knudsen, um, Rob Binskin, Owen Craig and Nicole Hearn. Um, so, so they did a great job as well. So um, yeah, so we are basically going to show a short video now, I think, and then uh, James is going to pray for Raj and the family. Hi, it's St Paul's Carlingford and North Rocks. I'm Raj Gupta. I'm married to Nicole and we have three children. Jordan, he has just commenced university from his bedroom, as I say. Lauren has just commenced year 12 and Ryan year 10. We are so excited to be joining you next year. St Paul's is a church through which the Lord has worked over a sustained period of time in reaching people for the gospel. Many have come to know Christ. Many have been nurtured as Christians. Many people have decided to serve the gospel as lay people as part -time, in part-time capacities and also in full-time roles. The church's foundation is God's word to us, the Bible, and it is a solidly reformed evangelical church. You guys have pioneered and innovated so much over the years and you have been driven by a desire to reach people with the mystery of Christ as it is revealed to us in God's word. We have been blown away to observe your sacrificial generosity um, uh, across the people of St Paul's in recent years that has facilitated the revamped and expanded facilities. We're so grateful to all who have been involved in the shaping of St Paul's over decades and its continued vision and continued sacrifices to reach even more people who are lost and perishing. There's been the former senior minister, Gary Koo, and before him, Bruce Hall. But you know, really, there have been so many staff and hundreds of lay people who have worked in a variety of teams and given sacrificially over a long period of time. And God has borne wonderful fruit for the gospel. And so with all of this background, it is so humbling to have been asked to join the leadership team at St Paul's. I myself became a Christian as a teenager. I grew up in Balmain where I was introduced to Jesus through the people of a couple of different churches and particularly as people taught scripture in public schools. It helped me connect with a church and I heard the gospel and God then worked in me to embrace the forgiveness that Jesus offers. I became heavily involved in campus Bible study at the University of New South Wales and eventually did an MTS apprenticeship there. And I am just so thankful that God has worked to help me know the priority for Bible in all of Christian ministry and for the variety of opportunities he's given me through making many mistakes, learning from experience and insight of others and studying at more college and other places. And maybe the Lord has used my own background. I just have this profound biblical conviction that we have been left in this world in no small part to reach those who are lost and perishing. Revelation 21 gives us this incredible glimpse of the future when God himself will be with his people and will be their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. And so I am excited and humbled to be joining the team at St Paul's and to work alongside you guys to bring the gospel to hundreds of thousands of people who desperately need to hear it. It's been a long year, I know, particularly with COVID. For myself, Nicole and my family, we still need to go through some grief as we say goodbye to the many people at Turngabby who we love so dearly. But over the first quarter of next year, we'll be moving house and we'll be finishing up here at Turngabby. And on Tuesday, 23rd of March, will be the commencement of ministry service. And we certainly hope restrictions will be further eased by then. In the meantime, a huge thanks to Dave and the whole staff team and so many others who have all contributed to making church work and continuing to reach people at this time. You guys have been doing an incredible job and we can hardly wait to be with you. Really looking forward to working with Raj. And uh, yeah, just really thankful for the year um, uh, and our nominators and their work. Um, we're going to pray now. I'm going to pray on behalf of the senior staff for Raj. Would you please join with me as we do pray uh, for him and his family? Let's pray. 
Almighty God and merciful Father, we give you humble and heartfelt thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for our nominators here at St Paul's that they have found a rector for us here in Carlingford and North Rocks. Thank you for Dave Kuhn's faithful service over the last 10 months as the acting rector. Father, we pray in thanksgiving for your goodness and loving kindness to Raj and Nicole. Thank you that they have responded rightly to the Lord Jesus and have been saved by him. And thank you that Raj has accepted the Archbishop's invitation to join us. Heavenly Father, we pray for Nicole that you would comfort and strengthen her in this time of transition. We pray that you would help her as she continues to partner with Raj. May you protect and preserve their marriage, continuing to stitch them together in oneness, that their love and faithful union would overflow in blessing to us here at St Paul's. Heavenly Father, we pray for Jordan, that you will help him to study at university faithfully and to serve you for a lifetime. We pray for Lauren, that you will guide and sustain her in her faith and as she completes her HSC next year. We pray for Ryan as he transitions over to St Paul's and as he enters year 10 and forges new Christian community connections from the ones he had in junior high school. Most merciful Father, we pray that you would bless Raj as he joins us here. We pray that you would clothe him with righteousness and that he would speak your word with boldness and conviction, that it would never be spoken in vain. Father, we pray that he will lead us to make healthy disciples in never increasing number to your glory. And we pray that we would be granted the grace to hear and receive what he will deliver out of your holy word. That in all our words and deeds here at St Paul's, we may always seek your glory and the spread and increase of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant this for the honour of Jesus our advocate and mediator. Amen. Amen. Friends, we're going to continue praying now. We're going to pray for our church and our world as we do every week. And so I'm going to invite Edmund. Hey there, Edmund. Edmund, and then Lucy. Hello, my name's Edmund. We're going to continue praying. Uh, I'm praying about championing the cause of the gospel. So let us do that. Lord God, thank you that you have shown us time and time again that you are compassionate and gracious, abounding with loyal love and faithfulness. Thank you, though, thank you that even though we continue to sin, you show your love to us in that Jesus came to die in our place. Thank you that we are no longer blind to your majesty and no longer mute to your glory now that we have seen such a great light that is Jesus. Being sprinkled by his blood, may our tongues be tasteful to one another and our eyes be respectable to one another as we champion the cause of the gospel, making disciples of people from all nations that they may also call Jesus their Lord. We pray that at St. Paul's, all of us will be committed to this glorious goal, to testify without adding or subtracting our deadness and grief in our sin and speaking of the fullness of the grace of God that gives us forgiveness for our transgressions and life in Jesus, his son. We thank you that even though there was a period of time where when churches were not able to meet together, you have been gracious in adding to your number people willing to take up your ministry in ever expanding contexts, whether it be in growth group leading, formation of new service teams, leading Sunday school and scripture classes, or even the dogged tenacity of, ch of our church members to meet together safely. It is for these people, as well as the servant hearts of our mission and ministry teams, that we pray for joyful persistence to follow up with friends and family who may be interested in joining church. Help us to become an increasingly caring community, welcoming to any and all people. May they join us in ever increasing number, connecting to us just as we connect to you. By your will and by your spirit, may we continue to grow in this manner, worthy of the calling we have received. Amen. Amen.
Hi everyone. My name is Lucy. We will now keep praying for our world, in particular for university ministries and for our environment. So if you're comfortable, please join me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the work you are doing to bring the good news about your kingdom to universities across Australia. Thank you for the love and faithfulness you have shown to the uni students as they endured and overcome hardships during the pandemic. We ask that you will continue to show grace to your people on campus as students and staff prepare for the national training event and mission. Help them overcome difficulties of logistics as they cannot gather in the same way as they did previously. May you bless the labour of your workers so that as your word is spoken, it may bear fruit in the life of those who hear it. We ask that you will grow their love for one another and for those who have not yet heard your gospel. As they seek to partner with churches to bring your word to less rich communities in Australia, may you work powerfully through them so that your name will be made known and be glorified. Father, we would also like to pray for our environment. We thank you for creating our world and blessing us abundantly with everything we need to thrive. We thank you for continuing to sustain our world and for entrusting the environment to our care. We are sorry for the times we have not been good stewards and have selfishly propagated our desires to the detriment of the environment. We ask that you will forgive us and keep changing our attitudes so we would live in submission to you. And Father, as we approach summer, we want to also bring before you our communities who are susceptible to bushfires. We ask that you will show mercy to them so they may be spared of the suffering that they went through in the past. Help their local leaders to wisely plan and do everything in their power to remove potential hazards. We trust that you are in control and we entrust their safety into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, in just a moment, we're going to have an opportunity to be able to speak to one another. Um, and we're going to say goodbye to our friends on the live stream. But an important thing to say to our friends on the live stream is that from uh, this week onwards, we will no longer be having our after church Zoom meeting. Uh, last week, there was one person. And the week before that, there was two people. And we think it is time to say no more to the Zoom meeting. But you are still welcome to keep joining us via live stream. For our Christian members, we also hope that you're plugged into a growth group so that you'll be able to relate with brothers and sisters uh, in the growth group space. And hopefully, uh, outside of that as well, there are opportunities to be able to message, call, and chat with one another. But it's at the end of an era for the afternoon church. Zoom link. I will be getting rid of it very soon. But friends, let me pray as we close our time together and say goodbye to our friends on the live stream. Please join with me as we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit and send us, send us out with confidence in your word to tell the world of your saving acts and bring glory to your name. Amen. Goodbye, live stream. <laughs>